hit subscribe to the DIY writer to support your hardworking authors and also lessen your chances of ending up as a victim in their next book. Join me at the first annual Icarus Book Convention, May 8th and 9th. This conference has a great lineup of speakers, including little old me, talking about podcasts, vlogs, and other neat author stuff. Go to Icarus, I-Q-A-R-U-S, book, con, C-O-N, dot com for more information. Hope to see you there. This is Jeff Bacon with the DIY Writer Podcast, and today we're going to be talking with Deborah Donahue. Deborah, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Kind of chilling, literally, in Wisconsin. It <laughs> is uh, like 36 degrees out or something like that. I don't know. Um, they're teasing us with 70-degree weather this weekend. We all think the weathermen are lying. They can't possibly pull that off. Yeah, that sounds a bit extreme from one extreme to the next. <laughs> yeah, I just, I don't see it happening. So the uh, unfortunate thing was I went on vacation last week. I went down to New Orleans and then back up, you know, so I'm trailing through the South and it's 80 degrees out and it's like, oh, this is wonderful. And then come back up here. It's like 26, 27, mm. 36. Yeah, that's, uh, sounds pretty good to me in the eighties myself. Yeah. Well, anyway, so you wrote a book. Yes, I wrote a book. <laughs> you wrote a book. I used to live on Banning Street. What's that all about? It's a comedic coming-of-age story about a girl uh, growing up in small town, northwestern Ontario, back in the 80s. And as she tries to find her way through the heavy party scene and drug culture mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. era. And, um, you know, this the crazy hijinks that happen with her and her friends and all the zany stuff that happens and their misadventures, crazy zany misadventures and, and uh, silly stories of, of such. <laughs> like what? Give me, give me an example. Um, all right. Well, there was um, one instance where they went to um, a, a band like blowout thing at, uh, and it was, it turned into um a big riot anyway that it was a it was a band it wasn't a sanctioned um event for the weekend uh and there was all these different bands playing and um it was like packed with people and uh i guess somebody called the police and the police ended up coming <laughs> and it turned into a full-scale riot and uh the main character of the book danielle happened to be in the back seat of a car with her boyfriend and uh, she ended up making out with her boyfriend and uh, the, it was his friend, her friend's car. And it was, uh, I think it was a 1974 AMC Pacer and it was like lime green. So it was called the Frogger. And so she was in the back seat of the Frogger with her boyfriend making out when this riot started to happen. And so they didn't notice what was happening until they got out of the car. And it was like total, you know, total pandemonium. People were running around screaming. Uh -huh. Police were chasing people. Um, some people took a tree branch and smashed the truck window out. And while she had been in the back seat with her boyfriend, she noticed out of the corner of her eye there was a bonfire. And she thought to herself, "Oh well, good. It's good somebody uh, built a bonfire. It'll the smoke might help keep the mosquitoes away." Well, when they got out of the uh, car, the bonfire ended up being an upside down. Uh, police car that was lit on fire <laughs> so yeah so that was kind of one of the uh one of the hijinks of um of uh that uh, particular incident so they they ended up making it out and um but just barely and yeah so it was yeah it was just one of those crazy crazy times <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of funny i uh <clears throat> my first year in college I, um, there was a, a riot down at a homecoming, uh, for a homecoming event for a uh, college down in, uh, Brookings, South Dakota. Oh yeah. And <clears throat> so, you know, I mean, oh, okay. Well, you know, not sure why that happened, but whatever. And in the paper, there's three guys standing on top of a car that got rolled over. And one of them is the guy I went to high school with. It's like, uh oh, <laughs> yeah. He, <laughs> he couldn't deny he wasn't involved because he was standing on top of the car but you know 
<clears throat> at least at least they didn't light it on fire. Uh, yeah, I, I can't remember if they did or they didn't. I don't <laughs> think they did, but yeah, well. it does. It does make for a lovely uh, <clears throat> a lovely fire at night when you you know take a car and just light it on fire. Yeah, well, yeah, why not? Eh? Yeah, the uh, the tires keep the uh, the smoke from the tires keep the uh, mosquitoes away. I I like that part. Yeah, that's what I hear. Yeah. So what's uh, <laughs> what's your inspiration behind this? Um, my inspiration behind this was I, like I I've always journaled, like I I've always heavy duty journaled, and so I've always wrote or written, and I you know there's a few songs in the vault too. And I don't know, I've just always written about stuff and um, I'm glad I did. And um, well, actually the inspiration for the book comes from a friend of mine, really close friend of mine. Uh, we, um, we've been friends since we were like 14. So, um, you know, she, you know, we, you know, went out and partied together back in our younger days and stuff. And she ended up getting married really young she got married when she was 20 and started having kids right away. And I continued on like a complete crazy person, you know, in the bars and stuff for about another six or seven years after that. So whenever I would tell her about some crazy drunken night of total debauchery and, and mayhem, she would always say, Deb, you ought to write a book. <laughs> and it wasn't until the third time she said it that the light bulb went off. And I thought, hmm, yeah, maybe I should. Mm -hmm. So it, it started off like that. And it kind of just started off as like a fun thing to do. And then it just kept writing itself. I, I got really, um, I got like writer's block at chapter three for about three months. And then I thought I was done at chapter 21, but the book just kept writing itself almost. It, it was weird how it, how it went on. But actually, yeah, she's she's actually the inspiration for my book, because if it wasn't for her, you know, saying that, you know, Debbie ought to write a book, I, I probably probably wouldn't have, you know, for all I know. So, hmm. yeah, so it actually it was it was her that was the one that got me in that direction. <laughs> so, very, so very grateful, cool. very grateful to her. Yeah. Very cool. <clears throat> so um this is available on kobo and kindle and amazon ebay barnes and nobles and uh you have some chapters on indigo um so you went wide with this right away on your first publication pardon me you went wide with this on your very first uh publication yes yeah <clears throat> do you have a publisher go, big, go, bigger, or? go big or go home i always say go, right? go big or go home okay yeah very cool <laughs> um so what what's the time frame is that this is based in the 1980s 1980s okay mm -hmm. so um do you uh you know back when we we're actually able to go see bands and actually concerts and stuff like that before the uh you know the pandemic and and all of the uh horrible uh you know stuff that's happened in the last year um you know what what band i mean what what bands are you uh i don't want to say featuring in here but what band i mean do you have bands in mind when you're writing this actually i did include uh partial lyrics of certain songs of the era because i felt it had it helped to enhance the storyline in certain parts of the book so um part of the process of doing that though was finding out who actually owned the copyright uh copyrights to to those songs sure, sure. and um for run like hell i found out hell leonard owned 50 percent of run like hell but they couldn't tell me who owned the other 50 percent and it's like well how can you own 50 percent of a song but not know and so it took like about three months of detective work to figure out who owned the other 50 percent and at one point I thought I was going to have to take those lyrics out. Um, so yeah, I, I included partial lyrics of songs and another song um, of the lyrics I included was um, Fire by Bruce Springsteen. Mm -hmm. So I actually had to deal with Bruce Springsteen's lawyers, Ruben, Shire, Sachs, and Marsalis. 
in New York and I had to pay 400 American to have one one title, like one little bit of the of the chorus. And when um and when we kiss, ooh fire. I had to pay four hundred dollars just for that. Mm. American. Yeah. So um I was I was also denied two Led Zeppelin songs and two Motley Crue songs. Um, because in order to get permission, you have to send a page before a page containing the lyrics and a page after to these publishers that own the rights to these songs. So they could see what kind of context you're actually using the lyrics in. And um, so I sent, you know, sent, sent it to them like they had asked. And I, I, I was really surprised that I got these very strongly worded emails back. And I remember one of them saying, absolutely not. And you must take these lyrics out of your publication immediately because they thought my book was too racy <laughs> and i remember at the time i was kind of really po'd about it i'm but sorry what, whoa whoa got a little backlash there um what uh, what christian uh, uh, band was this that uh, thought it was too racy oh motley crew oh yeah because they're so conservative well, it's, it, they actually don't own the rights anymore. It, I think it's Alfred Music Publishing oh. that owns the rights. So you're not really dealing with the artist directly anymore. It's whoever owns the rights to the songs. Well, so there's these, there's these big publishing houses like Hal Leonard is one of them. Alfred Music Publishing is another one. Unisec is another one. Um, so I had to like write to them and ask and get permission. So yeah, for the two Motley Crue songs, and the two Led Zeppelin songs, it was the emails read, absolutely not. And you must take these publication, you must take these lyrics out of your publication immediately. <laughs> so uh, huh. at first I was, I was kind of really mad about it. And, um, but then I, I thought about it and I thought, you know, maybe being too racy isn't such a bad thing after all, you know? You know, they're saying they can't handle my book. So, you know, maybe that's not such a bad thing either. So I uh, took them out like I like I was asked and uh, just proceeded on with with the songs that I was allowed to have. So uh, which is quite a good collection of songs. So whenever I do write the screenplay, the um, soundtrack for the screenplay is is done, basically. <laughs> So there's some really good, good old tunes in there, like hard rock, heavy metal tunes. So, you know, well, what partial, you should... partial lyrics of anyway. You know what you should do is you should take a, uh, a a paperback and send it to Vince Neil with a note saying you could have been in here. Yes, yes, I, I should. Yeah. <laughs> Be like, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, that's. I should send. I should send them a copy of my book. <laughs> I know if I could find out where. Vince Neil? I um hmm, yeah, I'm not sure where he is. <laughs> I'm not sure either. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm sure there's an address someplace to send him something, but who knows if he gets it or not. But yeah, I'm sure there must be some fan mail thing or something. Something, send it to. who knows? But, yeah. uh, <laughs> any ACDC in there? No. Um what? No, there's no ACDC. There is, um... oh geez, I, I, my mind just went blank. Um, That's okay. Black Knight by Deep Purple. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I can't remember what the heck I put in there now. <laughs> some songs I, I got picked and some didn't. So um, that old Black Magic. Oh. Run Like Hell, mm -hmm. Free Ride, Black Knight. Um, there was an old disco song from the late, late eight seventies called in the bush. Uh, is she really going out with him? Joe Jackson. Sure. Bang yeah. your head, metal health and fire by Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. So those, those are the ones that I was allowed to have anyway. So I guess I should be thankful. I got, I got to have any, any of the lyrics that I wanted. Oh, and I also got denied. Um, you make me feel like dancing by Leo Sayer. I got denied that song too. Because the beginning of the book is, is 
It begins actually around 78, 79 in the beginning of the book. So Leo, that's when Leo Sayer was pretty big. So, mm -hmm. uh, so actually I got denied that song too. So there's actually four songs I got denied. But, you know, better four than none I, or, or all of them, I guess. So You so, got a yeah. pretty good pick in there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think so. That is a pretty good soundtrack. Mm -hmm, I'm hoping. I think it is. You know, but <clears throat> then again, I, I like I like that kind of music. But I can't believe that you got the bosses, <clears throat> you know, Bruce, Bruce Springsteen. I uh, that, that's pretty interesting. So basically, your process for doing that is is finding out who's got the rights holders or rights, who's holding the rights, bleh, yeah. and um, writing them a letter, and then they come back and either say yes, no, or maybe if you pay us, right. How many of them did you have to pay? Just Springsteen for, or? Oh, for all of them. Oh, yeah. 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 So some of them were like 300 American. I think one of them was 200 American. Bruce was 400 American. Yeah. Oh, you have to pay copyright permission for all of them and then get permission. And then after the whole process, I had to send them each a copy of the book so that they could check to make sure that what we, the way that we agreed upon the lyrics appearing in the book was how it was actually gonna turn out. Yeah. Yeah, so I had to send them all a copy of the book too once once it was out. Did you have to sign it too? No, I didn't sign it, no, oh. I, just, I just sent it. Um, no. When this thing gets big enough, just tell them to send it back to you and you'll sign it for an extra $300. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> then I'll, rec I'll recoup my losses for uh, having to dish out for all these lyrics. <laughs> how much did you spend in total on lyrics oh god um let me see so there's like oh, 400 for bruce uh so three six nine probably about 2500 bucks wow american yeah 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 Roughly about that. So about 10,000 Canadian. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might as well say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's before editing or, you know, cover work or any of that kind of stuff. That's uh, That's a hefty price to pay. Yeah, it is a hefty price to pay, but I just felt that, I just felt so strongly that the lyrics helped to enhance certain storylines throughout the book so I was really disappointed about the uh, Motley Crue lyrics though um because there there's one part of the book where it, they would have fit in so good well, one of them one of the songs was home sweet home and um the other one was live wire and actually there's one chapter called live wire and uh yeah so I was really sorry I, I lot I got I didn't get to have those lyrics in, but yeah. what can you do, eh? Too, ra uh, too racy, too racy. <laughs> that just blows my mind. Mm -hmm. Too racy for a Motley Cruz song. Yeah, that's right. So uh, like I said, I don't think it's a bad thing. I I've been getting really good reviews. People have been really, really liking the book. So, um, so how I long has this been published out there? Uh, it was a year March the 10th okay yeah so right in the middle of the uh right at the beginning of the lockdown stuff yeah i had planned on having a big um book release party <laughs> at a local pub here yeah and uh that had to be scrapped and so i don't know it looks like we're going back on lockdown again so i don't know when i'm ever gonna get to have that book release party but um hopefully someday Canada is pretty serious about their lockdown stuff from the way it looks. Yeah. Well, the numbers have been really climbing in Ontario. And now there's this variant virus that's invading everywhere. And so the premier was on the news today saying, yeah, lockdown after the Easter weekend. So mm. for another four weeks. So ho hopefully this will be it. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. Hopefully. I don't think so. No, I don't think so either, but here's to hoping anyway um, <laughs> that we have some some kind of summer. 
but um, yeah, I know I don't know who's to say it's getting scarier with this variant virus coming into the picture now. So I guess we can just hope all we can hope for is that we all get in, you know vaccinated as quickly as possible, and hopefully that will maybe help to shut this down somewhat. But or you know we're gonna we're gonna experience one of those horror books that we uh, that we love to read so much. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> You know, I I still uh, buy into the theory that the vaccine actually causes you know zombieism, and it's just all the Walking Dead starting all over. Hey, <laughs> you know, but, never know. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Yeah. Life is fun, isn't it? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, shoot. So you've taken this book and, you know, it's based on, you know, life experiences and, you know, some fictional stuff and probably some other things that you heard or saw or whatever. And mm -hmm. you're going to turn this into a screenplay. Right. Very cool. So have you started that process yet? I started it and um, I'm actually reading a book. Um, it's by this guy named Sid Field. Um, there was three screenwriting books, like how-to screenwriting books at Chapters that I was looking at, and I'm really glad I picked his. Um, this Sid Field guy, um, he's kind of like from old world Hollywood, um, but he, he uh, taught a screenwriting course at this um, college in California. Um, what was it called? Berkeley College of Experimental Arts, I think it was called, mm -hmm. and it was a college where um, Lucille Ball, Dustin Hoffman, and Paul Newman taught acting classes, and where, mm -hmm. um, you know, all the top directors were there, and he taught a screenwriting um, class there and stuff, so, uh, like, he's been in the business for a lot of, a lot, long time, so um, he really seems to know what he's talking about, so I'm sort of following his guidelines, and, um, but not everybody who is a novelist can be a screenplay writer either. Um, he also writes about um, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Are you familiar with who F. Scott Fitzgerald is? I am. Yeah, he wrote The Great Gatsby and mm -hmm. he wrote a lot of, he's a quite a, you know, revered um, novelist. And, but he tried to go into screenplay writing and he just couldn't seem to get the knack of it for some reason. Yeah. So not everybody who's a novelist can be a screenplay writer. So um, I'm just going to give it the old college try and see how it goes. But uh, it's a it's a whole different medium. You have to think in in pictures. And um, yeah. So um, one of the things he says in this book, this Mr. Sid Field guy, is when whenever you're I'm watching a movie now, I'm always aware of what's going on in the movie. If there's seagulls chirping in the background or if there's a skidding of tires. And uh, another thing he said is um, what keep, when you, whenever you watch a movie, what keeps you focused on that movie? Like what keeps you interested in the movie? Like sometimes there's movies you watch and you lose interest after the first five minutes. Um, so like he, one of the things I'm always aware of is like if I'm watching a movie, like what, what is keeping me glued to that movie? Like what is keeping me interested in keeping, you know, watching that movie? And um, so I'm, I'm always aware of whenever I'm watching a movie, to me, it's like my homework now. And, um, you know, fading in, fading out. Um, I, I guess the, if you're, if the first 10 minutes, okay, one minute of, um, one page of a screenplay equals one minute of screen time. So you've got about 10 minutes to get your point across about what the movie is about to your audience or else you're, you're going to lose, they're going to lose interest. So um, I'm always, you know, watching and I'm very aware now whenever I'm watching a movie, like how it, it, it interests me or it doesn't and, and things like that now. So it's, um, it's, it's quite a learning process on my own, but still, mm. you know, still working on it very cool so you're starting from the ground up no experience and you're going to write a screenplay that's pretty awesome well you know i um sylvester stallone had the idea for rocky and uh it was just an idea and he went to some i don't know hollywood executives or whatever 
and he presented the idea of Rocky and um, they said, well, write a screenplay. I think Sylvester Stallone only has like grade 10 or something. And um, back then, like we're talking what, 1977 or 75? I can't really remember when Rocky came out. We're talking about him hunting and pecking on a, a typewriter mm -hmm. to you know, punch this, this screenplay out. And um, you know, he, he got that screenplay out and, and look what happened. There's been like six Rockies. You know, so it, it, it you know, it, it, it worked out for him. And, um, and another, you know, story that inspires me is um, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon, they wrote the screenplay for Goodwill Hunting. Yep. And it took them seven years to sell that screenplay. Nobody wanted anything to do with it. And I think it wasn't until they became, started becoming actors um, and started becoming well-known actors that they finally got a break with with that screenplay but for seven years nobody would touch it nobody would look at it mm -hmm. but they they didn't give up and you know look at where they are today too no so. and <clears throat> i i think it was very i thought it was very interesting that robin williams was in the uh in goodwill hunting and in, in uh in that from what i understand he loved the screenplay when he read it oh yeah oh I, I never heard that yeah I wasn't, I can't remember if he was one of the first people to read it and then he helped push it through, but he had some involvement with it right up front. And I, oh, I don't did. remember. Yeah. I don't remember what it was. Um, but, uh, I, I just remember that from an interview It is with, uh, the three of them actually, I'm sure it's out there on YouTube someplace or whatever. And they were talking about it and it was, it was really hilarious because they're all three giving each other crap. And then yeah. Robin Williams would just, you know, who was a master of just punching, you know, punching somebody and <laughs> with, with humor and, you know, oh yeah, you know, and it, it was hilarious, but the story was, you know, just inspirational. I, I loved it, you know. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it's one of my all-time favorite movies, actually. And they still, um, I saw something on Facebook the other day where they were, uh, advertising for some charity or whatever, and Ben Affleck and... <laughs> was uh getting a little crap for not being batman anymore or he said oh. he said you could have lunch with batman and and uh um uh, the other guy i'm sorry um Matt Damon. Damon. yeah said oh uh you know the new batman was gonna bill Patton or whatever his name is the the new batman he's gonna be there and you know the guy who took your job you know and they, they just were giving each other crap and it just reminded me of that interview as funny as hell but um, the other uh, thing that you mentioned uh, from way back was Dustin Hoffman. I, mm -hmm. uh, um, he's, he's a guy I'd love to sit down with someday and just talk to just because he's got to have a, some interesting, interesting stories, I would think. Or I'd, I'd, I'd love to just hear him talk for like two hours on, you know, all the stuff that he's done. That would be very interesting, I think. Yeah, yeah. It would probably be pretty interesting if he wrote his memoir actually yeah <laughs> i think it would yeah that he's he's gone through and overcome and and everything else to get where he is and he's he's an interesting cat in the first place mm -hmm, for sure uh, yeah i've always liked him yeah he uh you know again i i thought it was um um when he made tootsie do you remember that oh. movie oh yes that was like holy crap what's he doing and you know he pulled it off and it was funny and it was you know it was i mean it was it was a good movie but at the time it was like oh you know a little taboo and it was uh it was, it was very gutsy for him to do that it didn't you know it didn't do anything but project him out yeah um and then you watch him in like in uh, kramer versus kramer you know that was interesting of course he's in all the president's men and you know i mean stuff like that but i mean his, rain 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 man rain man yeah yeah you know um of course you you can't uh, deny his uh you know uh how funny he can be like in movies you know like uh you know the fockers and all that stuff with with uh, ben uh, stiller but uh you know i mean he's just uh, he's a very dynamic individual but uh so oh, hopefully I, you know, I, maybe, I, maybe send it to him. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I just think of how lucky these students were that were able to attend that college and, you know, get you know, tutored by Dustin Hoffman, Paul Newman and Lucille Ball. Yeah. And, you know, 
and there was like, um, you know, screenwriting, there was directing. Um, it was, it was just a college just for the movie industry, basically. Mm -hmm. And, um, have you seen that, uh, that app they have out there called Ma it's like master class or something like that, where they have all these famous people give like six hour, uh, classes on, on doing different things. So you can learn how to cook. You can, you know, learn how to write novels, you know, you can, oh. Yeah, they it's uh, kind of. I think you pay like 190 bucks U.S. a year, and you get access to all these different classes that uh, these people have done. But I know there's some screenwriters in there and stuff like that. But it's kind of interesting. Oh, I have to check that out. Yeah, it's it's kind of cool. Maybe I could do a screenwriting a little course from there. Yeah, never know. Yeah. Couldn't hurt to learn a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. Well. So what else you got cooking? What else you got going on? Um, just, uh, working on the screenplay and just trying to promote the book and, um, that's about it. And oh. trying to get through this crazy COVID nightmare mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, just trying to keep sane throughout this crazy COVID nonsense. And, um, yeah, that's about it. I think sanity is a real high, I think you need to lower that bar because sanity is not something anybody has anymore. No, no, it doesn't seem like it. No, it just seems like there's a lot more craziness and nuttiness out there nowadays. <laughs> and um, yeah, so just trying to um, just focus on, yeah, just writing the screenplay and um, and that's about it, really. That's about it. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Nothing too exciting going on around here. Well, I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. I mean, if I could, if I could have my book release party, I, you know, I would be planning that right now. And um, I had a band lined up and everything. And um, yeah, so, so much for that idea. <laughs> eh, you know, hopefully you have it sooner than later. Yeah, well, maybe by the fall. Hopefully, maybe in the fall, I'll be able to do it once this, hopefully this virus kind of calms down and we're able to open, open things up again. But for now, we're shut down as usual. Shut down as usual. <laughs> Canada yeah. is closed again. What about where you are? We're opening up. Oh yeah. Yeah. Your numbers aren't that bad. I. <clears throat> it it depends on who you talk to, but everybody's kind of uh, getting sick of uh, being locked up, so things are opening up, and and you know they're they're getting rid of the mask restrictions, and you know it's it's slow but sure. Yeah. Oh, that's good. But, you know, so, um, you know, we've had a bunch of states that have opened up and just said, you know, screw it, we're done with this crap. And uh, it's been interesting to watch their numbers because they opened up, you know, they're allowing, you know, statewide, I shouldn't, there's certain cities that are still kind of closed down, but they're allowing, you know, 100% capacity in restaurants and, and no masks and everything else. And their numbers went down. And uh, yeah, so it's like, okay, well whatever you know uh, it, i think it depends on what side of the fence you're 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 sitting at but i i'm of the belief that if you're going to get sick you're going to get sick and you can't stand you can't stay in your house and and uh be and hide forever it. no you really can't no you know <clears throat> we've been through this stuff before time and time again spanish flu uh kung fu flu you know all this other stuff and yeah you know, it's just uh you know, it's life on the planet. Mm, yeah. So, you know, you can be careful, you know, my God, the, I think the funniest thing that uh, that's happened through this whole damn thing is people, you know, you see public service announcements saying, you know, maybe wash your hands more than you have before. It's like, yeah. who wasn't washing their hands? You know, were they the ones that started this? Those non hand washers, you know. I remember a few years back, I caught this flu. And it started out as an ear infection and it ended up like a double lung infection. And I was washing my hands like 20, 30 times a day. And, and I still ended up getting, you know, really super sick. And, and I, um, I, I was an A certified personal trainer back then. Um, I was for about 10 years. And uh, so I, I would take these, these uh, continuing education courses in the States. And um, I remember the one time when I caught this uh, double lung infection, a friend of mine had had it before me and I was talking to her on the phone 
and she was telling me how sick she was. It was this thing that was going around. And uh, she said, yeah, I, I had this ear infection and it, it turned into this double lung infection. I'm really super sick. I had to go on antibiotics and everything. And I remember hanging up the phone thinking, whoa, whoa, is she ever sick, eh? Well, then I ended up getting it and I was already booked to take um, a continuing education course um, for the weekend. Hotel was booked, course was paid for. So um, I took a round of antibiotics before I left. I was on it for five days, yeah. It was on it for five days and then we drove out on Thursday and the course, no, we drove out on Friday, the course, no, we drove out on Thursday and the course was Friday and Saturday, both days. And Sunday I had planned to go uh, to the Mall of America on the way back because I had never been before. Well, I just got worse and worse. And um, I remember in, uh, in the practical part of the course where we were all in the classroom, um, one of the guys recorded the, um, the you know, the, 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 the course and the, the instructor speaking and whatnot. And uh, I ended up getting a recording of that, um, of that, that he did and all you can hear is me hacking and coughing in the background like I'm surprised they even let, like, let me stay in that course like all you can hear is me hacking and coughing and hacking and coughing and uh, I, I remember there was a emergency room nurse in in that course and uh, I, I said to her you know I, I took these antibiotics before I left to come here but they don't seem to be doing anything and uh, she said, yeah, we've been seeing a lot of this coming through the emergency room. So it was even there at the time. But I mean, the, the whole point of my story was at that time, I was washing my hands 20, 30 times a day. Mm -hmm. And I ended up catching this, whatever it was. So um, it was so bad. I scrapped going to the Mall of America. I just said, I just want to get home. I got back here. Um, I went back to the doctor. I got put on... I think it was something called biaxin. I had to take it twice a day, this really heavy duty uh, antibiotic for 10 days. And by the seventh day, I still wasn't getting any better. And my partner at the time was going like, what the heck's going on here? Like, you know, are you ever gonna get better? And it was, it was like a really brutal strain of flu that was going around at that time. I, like I did finally get better, but it, it sure took a long time. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I always wash my hands and it didn't help me much. So um, I, I, I just hope it, it does for this, but I mean, who knows? I mean, it doesn't seem to be stopping. So the one thing that I, I, I watched a Joe Rogan podcast a while back and there's a Dr. Rhonda Patrick <clears throat> that's big into, uh, well, she's, she's a, she's a, 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 a natural, she's a scientist and she is big on you know studying uh you know biochemistry and you know just just anything to do with the body and she has a very convincing argument to take you know d supplements zinc supplements and i think uh uh, uh quercetin or something like that uh, actually yeah quercetin um i have a bottle of it right here and so i started doing that and, and she said well you know if you want to keep you know, your, uh, your immune system up, this is what you should be taking because you're not, you know, chances are you're not getting it in a natural way and not getting enough. And I, I work inside all day, so I'm not obviously out in the sun. The coceritin is, uh, helps you absorb the vitamin D and then, and then also the zinc, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I probably a couple of years before this thing came out, I started taking that and I don't really get sick anymore. Oh. And it's like, okay, you know, cause once a year I get the flu. And then when I started doing that, I just, I didn't get the flu. I didn't get, you know, I get colds, but they wouldn't last nearly as long as they used to, you know, mm -hmm. allergies. I still have a problem with every now and then, but it's just like, holy crap. So, you know, taking a regimen of D zinc and, and, uh, in that, uh, Caseritin, um, it was, you know, it, it seemed to work very well for me, but and so, of course, when COVID came around, I was like, let's up the dose. <laughs> yeah. Let's just make sure. And I, I, I'm an IT guy. So I go in and out of offices all day long. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been doing that even, even while the uh, quarantine was in place. Um, I was considered uh, um, essential. Right. 
because yeah. of some of the contracts I have. And uh, it, uh, you know, I, I never, I haven't had, I haven't even been sick this year. Oh, that's good. Good for you. Yeah. And I've been around, you know, plenty of places that like, oh, you know, we had somebody with COVID in here yesterday or, you know, three days ago and they got tested and it's like, oh, good. You know, so I've been kind of waiting just to get it and I never got it. And I'm like, I don't know if I can attribute it to what I've been taking, but it's, I've been a lot luckier than a lot of people. Yeah. I'm going to have to look into this Quisertin. I've, I've never heard of it before. Yeah, I, I hadn't either, but uh, I've heard uh, two uh, two doctors mention it in the last year, and then Rhonda, like, like to her, Dr. Patrick a couple of years ago, and it's just like, okay, you know, it, it all has to do with, you know, taking something and then making sure that your body can absorb it, so this combination seems to work, I guess, mm. I don't know, or it's all in my mind, I've just been really damn lucky, I don't know, I'm not a scientist, I'm an IT guy. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take a little bit of luck and, and, uh, a little bit of health and everything else that goes along with it. So, um, we're kind of running to the end of things here. So do you, uh, do you have anything else you want to say to your readers, fans or anything like that? Or anybody who's thinking, you know what, I'd like to read this book, but you know, give me your sales pitch. Sell me on it. Um, actually I was very surprised. Um, I have a, I have my Facebook page as author Deborah Donahue and I posted last week, somebody in Belgium actually bought my book. Oh, really? Yeah. They messaged me and I was just like, I couldn't stop smiling the whole day. And they said they had to order it from some London depository. Um, they were, they were, if they ordered it from Canada, it was going to take eight weeks, Yeah. but they yeah. ordered it from somewhere in London. And I'm like thinking, I didn't even know you could order my book in London and uh, some book depository in London. And he got it in three weeks, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was, I was very pleased about that. And then I, I thought later I, I messaged him back and I said, where exactly was this book depository in case, you know, anybody else overseas yeah. wants to order the book. Um, so I did post that on my Facebook page as well, where you could get it if you you are overseas so i was um huh. yeah very happy about that and getting getting really good reviews on goodreads.com and um so like there's been a more than a few people that have said they read it in one or two nights they couldn't put it down mm -hmm. and one of the, the first people was my sister um i gave it to her i wasn't even published then i gave it to her on a on a stick and um she said she stayed up all night and read it. She was, she stayed up till six o'clock the next morning. And I was like, Nancy, you didn't have to do that. And she said, well, it was really good. I couldn't put it down. And mm -hmm. I thought it was just, you know, my sister, right? That. you know, it's like my sister, you know, and, um, she was just bored at home one night. And, but there have been other people that have said they, they've read it in one or two nights. They couldn't put it down. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really happy with the reviews I've been getting and stuff. I just need to get more exposure out there and, and do more promoting. I, I have, I'm slated to be booked on the Colorado Phil show um, and some other radio stations. And I've done a few radio interviews. So I'm, I'm basically been looking to, most of my time is spent like writing to radio stations to hopefully get yeah. you know, some more, uh, some more interviews. And I had a really good uh, interview on CFNO fm back in january and yeah so i've been just like hunting around looking for get more interviews and getting more exposure and mm -hmm. i mean i have five thousand facebook friends so i guess i get some exposure there as well and um and I, i'm and now i've gone global I, i'm i'm in europe <laughs> <laughs> so that was um that was like the best news ever so that was i'm very very happy about that very cool. Well, you know, the, the subject that you're writing about is, is, yeah, it's, 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 you know, the coming of age part of it. I mean, there's quite a few books about that, but when you place it in the eighties, there's a lot of people that don't understand the magic of the, uh, you know, 70, 60s, 70s and eighties were really a cool time. 
you know, mm-hmm. the, yeah, the, were. when I listen to my parents talk about, you know, what, what they did in the sixties, it's like, holy crap, you know? And mm-hmm. when I was a teenager, I'm like, Oh, I have to do that. You know? I mean, yeah. even, you know, just simple little stories of what well, we did this just because we thought it was fun. It's like, that is fun. Okay. Thank you. Noted. You know, I mm-hmm. mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff that happened in the eighties that, um, there's a lot of people that, uh, especially the younger kids now, you know, would be like, Oh my God, that blows my mind. I can't believe you did stuff like that. Cause they don't, they do different things now. You know, it's a, it's a, if, you know, they have their phones and their social media and their games and, you know, it, it's, it's a different kind of life. But back then it was, you know, I mean, <laughs> The old joke of, you know, you pick up a pay phone and call your parents collect and say, hi, this is Jeff. I'll be half hour late. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The eighties were kind of a wacky time. It was, um, you know, the, the fashion, the music, pastel suits, neon colored clothing. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was, it was, people seemed to be like less uptight yeah, and less stressed out back then. There was no social media. Like it, it just seemed like a, a simpler time. And everything was way over the top. Hair, hairstyles were big and way over the top. Clothes were neon green and tacky. But it, it just it just seemed like nobody seemed to mind. Eh? It was just nobody it was just cared. The way it was. Yeah, it was just the way it was. Yeah, and, uh, it was just fun. And sneaking off to a concert was something that you just did. Yeah. Oh yeah. Of you course. Know. I mean, you yeah. didn't really, you didn't really take no for an answer. It's like, okay, no, can't go to that concert. Okay. I'm going to go stay overnight at Steve's house, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to, we're going to watch some TV and maybe play some cards. I don't know. Something like that. But you know, we used to have full blown poker tournaments, you know, I mean, oh, yeah. you'd sit down and, uh, you know, somebody would, uh, you know, get somebody to buy him some cigars and we'd have plenty of beer and, you know, we'd try and take shots like big, like, like men. And uh, that, that never turned out real well, but you know, and, and we'd have these all night poker tournaments thinking that we're really cool. You know, yeah. if you left with 10 bucks, you're like, Oh my God, I'm buying, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it was, it was just, you know, it was, it was fun, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, I, I don't know. It, it was just, it was just, it was a, a different feeling than, you know, I've got, I've got four kids. And I don't think they've experienced anything that I remember in my childhood. No, no, for sure. You know, no. even when the oldest one says, well, you know, I was sneaking around. Yeah, I know you're sneaking around. Of course yeah. you were. You're just not as good at it as we were. No. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, the 80s were a really fun time. I'm, I'm glad I, I got to experience it. And I'm glad I got to write about it. And I'll, like one of the reviews, the good reviews I get is, how I, I take people back to mm-hmm. that time with my writing and with the music and stuff. And, you know, people are very appreciative of, of somebody writing about that time. Cause I guess they, they missed that time too, you know? Yep. Yeah. It was, it was a, it was a kind of a wacky time era, but it was fun. And um, yeah. So I'm glad I, I got to like revigorate people's memories with how the eighties actually were. I tell you, I'm kind of smiling thinking about it. So I can't imagine uh, not reading your book and just smiling all the way to uh, to the end, going, "Oh yeah, I remember that." <laughs> you know that kind of stuff. Yeah. So with that, I'm going to say, hey, if anybody else is out there reminiscing and wants to relive the '80s, you should probably. I'm not going to say probably. You should pick up. I used to live on Banning, uh, Banning Street by Deborah right. Donahue, and if you wouldn't mind. Um, take a look at, uh, my website or my, uh, my, uh, uh, you know, YouTube or whatever, like it, follow me, subscribe, whatever. So I can keep on bringing you some interviews from some authors that, which are, uh, uh, turning out to be a great thing for the authors and a lot of readers. So it's been quite fun. Um, but with that, Deborah, I want to thank you very much for the time you give me today. I love the premise and I love your, uh, just everything I've read about your book and everything that you told me today. Um, I'm especially impressed that you have all those lyrics in there. Cause I'm like, Oh yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna have to go back. I'm gonna have to pull up my, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to pull up my uh, music service and bring some of those up and, ma- and make a uh, playlist for this. But with that, 
Thanks again very much. This is Jeff Bacon with the DIY Writer Podcast telling you, you know what, things are going to get better. Please keep your chin up and have a great day. Bye-bye. Please hit the subscribe button. I get a bonus for every subscriber and I only need 1,506 more to become a full-time paid employee. Help me please.